one person. Who was the one person who cheered? There we go. Uh, Liam Payne apologises. He can't make this gig either. Uh, I'm Ewan Spence. So um, I will be your replacement here for our panel, uh, which has three of the uh, people who are making huge waves in VR content and who are helping create a brave new world for us all to explore uh, and hopefully profit from over the next few years. We have Jack Meth, we have Christian Catano, and we have Jens Christensen. Uh, my time is already running, so we've lost a minute and a half already, guys. So we're going to have to go slightly sharpish. So I'll ask you to introduce yourselves as well as answering our introductory question. First of all, VR is a new media, so what are your companies doing to define VR? Um, yeah, so uh, I'm Jens Christensen, founder and CEO of uh, Jaunt uh, VR, and uh, we're really focused on uh, cinematic VR, uh, which is really sort of the video or TV watching equivalent of VR as opposed to gaming VR. And uh, what we do is we have a, a camera that records all around. We have cloud software. Uh, we have apps to deliver uh, the content. And then we have uh, John Studios based in Los Angeles uh, that's working with content creators uh, to help create these VR experiences. Christy. Hi, I'm Christine Catano. I'm the executive producer and co-founder of Framestore VR Studio. Framestore, if you're not familiar with us, we're an Oscar-winning visual effects company. You've probably seen our work on films like Gravity, Guardians of the Galaxy, and a host of other film and uh, commercial work that you've seen over the last two decades. Uh, about right now, two years ago, we were starting out to create uh, our first virtual reality project for Game of Thrones. Um, and after the wild success of that, we set up our own dedicated virtual reality studio. So it's my responsibility to head up, lead, and uh, expand the team that's dedicated to exploring virtual and augmented reality content in all of its forms. Um, over the last few years, we've worked with brands, directors, um, studios, and other IP to develop over 18 VR projects for Game of Thrones, Marvel's Avengers, Paramount Interstellar, and we're just getting started. Jack. Hi, I'm Jacques Mété. I'm the president of uh, Cirque du Soleil Media. It's a division of Cirque du Soleil and Bell Media in Canada, and our purpose is to, uh, I would say, take Cirque's essence and brand into the world of uh, virtual reality. Not unlike uh, our friends here at Jaunt, uh, we are focused on live action. Uh, we're on the content side, and our approach is to create unforgettable experiences using some of our IP, but going as far as the limits of VR will allow us, and we're willing to help define these limits if ever there are any. And we're back on schedule. So the popular view of VR is, is headsets, gloves, sitting alone in a bedroom playing a first-person shooter. But VR can be far more than that. So why is that stereotypical view of the headset and the glove the wrong way to approach VR? Christine, let's start with you with all the, the Game of Thrones and everything, which yeah, sure. utterly intrigues me. I mean, you know, I think that that perception is a little bit left over from, like, the 90s VR craze. I sort of, you well, know... You mentioned Lawnmower Man here, aren't Yeah, they? and I equate that with, like, Dave and Buster laser tag and stuff like that. I mean, I think right now, when I look at the perceptions in virtual reality that I'm experiencing, it's more that people are thinking of it very literally. You know, I'm literally here. I am literally that person. I'm literally doing that. And I think for us, what we really try to you know, get people to get past is that that's fine, film started out incredibly literal, but it wasn't until sort of people really started to get past the technical hurdles and develop a language of storytelling that was unique to the medium that people really started to start using their imagination. So I think that's really important right now for us is to think not so literally, but move towards being more creative and using your imagination. Exact same question. Uh, I think that uh, the reason people think that it's all about hardware is because that's mainly almost anything that's been available in VR right now. I think that the next step is providing compelling content uh, that will make you forget the hardware that you have in your face. Uh, not to mention the fact that as technology evolves, it will become faster, cheaper, simpler, uh, so that the audience and the producers will be able to concentrate on the experience on the content itself. And that, I think, has to be the next step. So does that mean that you're still going to have the gloves in the headset? 
right now, I don't see any other possibility, although there are all sorts of other kinds of experiences like augmented reality and so on. But as far as virtual reality is concerned, I don't know anything else but this other than uh, you know, flight simulators, which are sort of virtual reality, but need a very complicated and very expensive hardware. I think the simplest thing is putting a phone into a contraption of some sort and eventually having a dedicated machine that will be affordable. The only thing right now that is sort of aff affordable is the combination of a phone plus a, a headset of some sort. Yes. Yeah, no, I, I think uh, f from our point of view is we don't want to require people to actually go out and have to buy uh, special controllers and so on. We want to be able to have even sort of the lowest common denominator uh, be essentially a headset with smartphones and for people to have a compelling uh, experience uh, doing that. So, for example, my, my mom uh, watches our cinematic uh, VR content and she doesn't own a controller. You know, I, I could give her one, she wouldn't even know what to do with it. Uh, so uh, f uh, that's very important uh, for us. Now, if you happen to have the full set, the controllers, the gloves, the backpack, uh, we will support that. You know, we, we want to make sure you, you can have the best uh, experience possible. But I think it is important uh, in order for this really to become popular that you can reach a, a mass audience. Uh, and in fact, today, I would say, you know, over 80% of our users today are on smartphones uh, as opposed to dedicated headsets. I mean, you, two of you have mentioned smartphones. Christine, have you got any experience on, on that side of the, of the smartphone? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's really important to understand that there's two types of virtual reality content right now. There's pre-rendered VR content, which is, um, you know, the more cinematic live action and or CGI like video content, and that's usually um, better geared towards mobile devices. And then there's real-time rendered content, which functions best on um, platforms like the Oculus Rift and the Vive and the PlayStation VR, the most popular right now. So I think it's important to understand those two areas. The, um, the video content that's on mobile, I think that's a great, you know, sort of gateway drug for people. You mentioned a lot of people are on phones right now. That's what people have in their pockets. It makes sense. That's their intro to VR. Plus, not a lot of the headsets are out there right now. But I think, you know, it'll be interesting to see what happens next year when sort of these consumer level headsets come out because they allow for a lot more immersive and interactive content. If you're in a game engine environment, you can really start using those controllers to interact and the environment reacts to you. And that can be an incredibly powerful experience. So we talked there, I mean, you, we talked the consumer side, but Jack, what about on the side of the creation? Has there been that same? commoditization and dropping of price for what you use to create the VR content? Well, on, on, on the production side, uh, indeed the hardware right now, if you want to have a high quality, is cumbersome, clumsy, and expensive. And post-production, I, I would say, is the hardest part. Because basically, you're stitching a bunch of pictures together. And if you want a seamless, stereoscopic experience, the level of quality has to be very, very high. You know, as we all know, technology has a normal tendency to become faster, avail more available, and cheaper. So I think that you know, a year from now, the answer to this question will not be the same. And I think that a couple of years from now, it'll be as simple as it is to film normal digital uh, pictures. Uh, devices will be available. Softwares will be available to stitch all of this seamlessly and give us a real fabulous experience. And there's another aspect that is extremely important is whatever the device you use, if it's a phone, uh, the answer is simple. The, the definition of the screen has to be as very high so that you lose the perception of the pixels. I mean, when we say have Apple have that, the, the, the famous retina display, it's about 320 DPI, are you talking that sort of level of DPI, more DPI? It has to go beyond this. It has to be, you know, we've, we've tried several phones. The one we've tried the most is Samsung because they're the ones with a combination of phone plus headset. Uh, the latest phone is, is a very high definition phone, but it still needs another step 
so that we really lose the pixels. If the action is compelling, you will lose it. It's like any good story you can watch on a small screen, but you know, it, it's better. The, the, the experience of being there virtually really works when there's no obstacle between you and the experience. So now we're seeing a couple of smartphones with 4K screens coming at that sort of level is going to be needed. Yeah, and that is around the corner, as we all know. I mean, a year from now, it'll be available. Yeah, I think Sony have actually already released one at the very top end, so that's going to be coming down. Jens, what about, again, on, on that production side? What sort of commoditization are you seeing in the tools and the software? Are we at the point where, you, where somebody can go off the shelf to, for VR creation tools? Uh, you're almost there. I mean, you can, uh, I, I think there are open source rigs available, so you can go out and buy uh, like GoPros and put them together in a rig. And then uh, it's, you're, it's possible to go out and, and buy software for doing uh, the stitching. Um, so it, it's, it's still kind of a D, DIY thing uh, today. Uh, but, um, you know, I would say within, you know, within a year you'll have much more accessibility to the general public. You know, Google recently uh, announced an effort uh, where uh, they're providing GoPro rigs uh, and a solution for people. Um, and what we do at Jaunt is we have a very high-end camera. It's not, it's really a professional level camera, uh, very expensive to build. Uh, and we make that available to partners uh, who want to create uh, really high-end professional content. Uh, and then we also have the, the cloud solution that, uh, as Jacques was saying, you know, automatically uh, stitches uh, the images together in stereo, uh, in 3D, uh, so that you don't really uh, have to do anything beyond that. But the reality is that uh, you know, the content creators have a set of tools that they're used to, you know, whether you know, editing tools, compositing tools, audio mixing tools. Uh, we spend a lot of effort making sure that uh, we can support all those tools using our VR experiences. We, we don't think people should migrate to a whole new set of tools uh, and have to relearn that. It's, it's possible to use existing uh, content creation tools along with uh, you know, the VR camera and the cloud solution to create compelling experiences. What do you think it's going to take to put VR into the mainstream? At the moment, it's, you, know, you still have to get a, a very high-end smartphone in front of your face, which is what we're looking at next year. What will it take during 2016 to, to go into the mainstream for, for more adoption to actually be seen in VR? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, um, there's really two key things that I sort of think are very important. I mean, on one side, you have you know, the comfort and content factor. There has to, it has to be a comfortable experience. You can't get sick, you know, and it has to be a comfortable device to wear. But also from a content perspective, beyond just entertainment, and we're all here to talk about entertainment content, I think you know, VR really needs to provide a valuable utility to people on an everyday level. And I mean, there's been people out there that have been using VR in health, psychology, like military training, workplace training for a long time. But I think that really needs to move forward to the mainstream. Second to that, I think, you know, right now, like I said earlier, we're using VR very literally in content creation. And I think, like, I try to get everyone to remember, at the end of the day, the medium of VR is something that allows for 360-degree 3D content powered by an interactive uh, computing device. So by nature, it's interactive. And if you go back and you look at all of, like, VR is not a new thing. If you go back and look at all the textbook definitions of VR, by definition, VR is an interactive thing. It's something that users need to feel immersed in. So I think, you know, for us, we haven't, we've only begun to scratch the surface of the true power of the medium and create content that's unique to the medium. So I think once that starts to take off in a way that's unique to just VR alone, I think that's when people will really start to see its power. Jack, the mainstream challenge, what do we do? The short answer is unforgettable content. Uh, I think that you know, if the gear becomes really sophisticated and it works well and it does everything, uh, what was just said, it's great, but there has to be great content. It has to be compelling. The experience has to be something you want to have. Uh, and that's what we're concentrating on. Uh, and I think, you know, that, it, uh, again, if you want to do uh, live action content and, and tell a story, uh, there's a theatrical aspect to this that uh, can be very, very interesting. So, but I think that it will work if, if it's affordable and if it's the content if, is really, really good. I think it's the simplest answer. 
Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more. I think uh, in some sense the hardware is sort of leading the, the way here. And uh, but when people get their first headset, it's very important that there be compelling content to go to. Otherwise, you know, the, the headset is, is sort of useless. So, so content is, is key here. And uh, it's really about enabling, you know, top content creators uh, to, uh, to give them the facility, the tools, uh, and, and help them also get started with what is essentially a new medium, right? Um, where you have to, uh, you know, as Christine was saying, you have to figure out how to tell a story in VR. That, that, that's not necessarily trivial. You know, you're used to uh, blocking, you're used to a 16 by 9 rectangle, you know, throw all that out the window yep. and, and figure out new ways of capturing people's attention uh, and, and uh, moving a story forward and, and making it more interactive. Uh, so, um, so, so yeah, for us, the key is really, uh, you know, creating, allowing people to create really top-notch content so that when people get their first headset, uh, they, they can really enjoy it. I'd like to add something. We always forget to talk about the sound in VR, which is extremely important and has to be treated much differently than we normally treat sound on a, on, on a regular picture, where there's left, right, and eventually behind. With VR, you have to create a fabulous image and then create a fabulous song, song and, ha and treat them separately so that if something happens behind you, the sound comes from behind, and then if you turn your head to watch it, then it's in front of you. So that technology is also quite sophisticated, and it allows for storytelling in a fabulous manner, because then you can play with sound and picture to tell your story and grab the attention of the viewer. If you had to give VR one hashtag for 2016, what one hashtag word would you give it? For hashtag 2016, huh? Uh, yeah, I don't know. You're, you're kind of stumping me here. Um, one word. Uh, what's that? <laughs> Just one word. Just one word. Yeah. Um, and you're well, I, 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 thinking now. Well, I mean, this, I, I would say cin hashtag cinematic VR. Cinematic. Is what I would say. Yeah. Um, this is a long hashtag, and I'm stealing someone else's quote. But um, a, really a really good quote I heard lately was, it's the worst it's ever going to be right now. And it's true, it is right now. I mean, I always, when you talk about hardware and it being clunky, I just look back to like the 90s and the Zach Morris phone that we all thought was incredibly cool. None of us could have ever imagined it would evolve into the smartphones that we have in our pocket right now. So you sort of need to have that same perspective when you're thinking about VR right now. You've won that bet to get a safe by the bell court in. Congratulations. <laughs> One word there. I would say stories like you've never experienced them before. Stories, cinematical, it is going to get better. That is VR content, that's the future of VR. Thank you very much for your time and attention. You'll be able to find links to all of our uh, sites and email addresses back in the official Web Summit application. So um, enjoy the rest of your time in Dublin and wherever we end up next year, we'll see you then. Thank you very much.